Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I know you've got many things on your plate. And um, speaking of that, congratulations on the Starship rocket last week and the first soft landing in the ocean for the world's most powerful rocket vehicle. It's a remarkable achievement. You are taking the fiction out of science fiction. Can you share with us what your thoughts, what thoughts were running through your head when you saw that happening, and what's next? I would say I was incredibly excited that we uh, achieved those milestones. I, I thought perhaps we had maybe a 20 or 25 percent chance of achieving both milestones, where the booster and the ship both did a soft propulsive landing in the ocean. And uh, so it really was, we achieved all the objectives, which I thought was unlikely. And um, that's thanks to an incredible team at SpaceX. We've got the most talented team of uh, rocket engineers that has ever been assembled. And that's, that's how we're able to accomplish these things. So it's always an honor to work with uh, great people to accomplish great things. So what's next in the final frontier? What do you see ahead for space? The founding purpose of SpaceX is to develop the technologies necessary to extend consciousness beyond Earth. But this is sort of a little cerebral, but perhaps appropriate for a Cato uh, event. <laughs> They're quite cerebral. But um, if you think about uh, the sort of Fermi filters of, um, you know, en Enrico Fermi was always wondered, where are the aliens? Why do we not see signs of them? <laughs> and I frequently get asked, are there aliens on Earth? And I'm, I haven't seen any signs of aliens. And I promise you, the minute I see any evidence of aliens, I'll immediately post it on the X platform. Um, <laughs> the most popular post of all time. Um, so... But th that we haven't actually seen any evidence, or I'm not aware of any, suggests that consciousness is extremely rare. You know, if we believe the archaeological record and standard model of physics, Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Civilization, as measured by the first writing, is only about 5,000 years old. So archaic pre cune of roughly 5,500 years ago was the first writing. I think that's a good date for the start of civilization, which means that civilization has only been around for one millionth of Earth's existence, almost nothing. I think this potentially argues for civilization being fleeting and fragile. And so the thing that we can do to increase the probable lifespan of civilization is to be a multi-planet species, to extend consciousness to other planets, ultimately to other star systems. And this would massively improve the probable lifespan of humanity and consciousness as we know it. It's, it's really trying to get past the single planet Fermi filter. That's the goal of SpaceX. That's why we're building such a big rocket. It's far in excess of anything that's needed to put satellites into Earth orbit. And uh, it's really a planet colonizer. It's uh, intended to build as quickly as possible a self-sustaining city on Mars. And I, I think the, you know, there's it's somewhat of a race between making a self-sustaining city on Mars and global thermonuclear war or some calamity. If we have some civilization ending, ending calamity before that happens, then, you know, that's all they wrote. Some, perhaps some future aliens will discover our civilization and they almost got there. Um, <laughs> So that's the goal. I think that's kind of an important thing to convey to people in the audience who think about the future and care about the not just the preservation, but the extension of civilization, the growth of the scope and scale of consciousness. So yeah, that's the goal. Make life multiplanetary is the goal of SpaceX. And you know, along the way, we'll seek to generate revenue from any space-based activities, such as uh, providing, building an internet system in space, anything that's sort of space-related in order to fund the extension of consciousness beyond Earth. That makes a lot of sense to me. We shouldn't keep all our eggs in one basket. We should try to diversify risk. So thank you for doing mankind's work. But that's not the only thing you're doing. <laughs> uh, if anyone has missed it, you're also revolutionizing electric cars and it's Neuralink, it's AI, the, the boring company. And if you missed that, he recently bought Twitter and <laughs> renamed it X as well, where we're live streaming as, yeah. uh, right now. It's <laughs> See, that's popular to, with the audience. <laughs> to, to, it's exhausting just yeah. to read the list of these things. I think what's Alex Ferguson, uh, the football coach, the soccer coach, who said that hard work is a talent, but it's also hard, <laughs> and it's actually quite exhausting. So the question is, what's the big plan? What's the overarching goal? Is it just that you can't help yourself from getting involved in every technological field, or is there an overarching goal? Yeah, the overarching goal is to take the set of actions that are most likely to improve the probability that the future is good, and that leads to the expansion of consciousness and our understanding of the, the universe. You know, this is somewhat prompted by you know, trying to figure out what's the meaning of life. You know, I had this existential crisis when I was a kid trying to figure out like what's the meaning of life is it just pointless like and um I read a lot of books on, on philosophy and religious books and whatnot. And ultimately, the thing that I thought was most enlightening was um, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where you know, Earth is basically this giant computer to answer the question of what is the meaning of life, um, and comes up with the answer 42. But it turns out that actually the, <laughs> the easy part and the hard part is the question. We don't actually know the right questions to ask. So I thought, well, if we expand the scope and scale of consciousness, then we're better able to understand what questions to ask about 
the answer that is the universe. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, great book, and I advise everyone to read it. Uh, maybe you can become the next Elon Musk if you do. Thank you also, Elon, for putting the role of the moderator and the interviewer in, uh, on a, in the spotlight, coming up with the right questions. That's the most important thing. So let yeah. me ask you the next question then and try to probe a little bit deeper into what you're really doing. Because as I understand it, you have six companies that you're running, but you also have a seventh or did you just come up right. with another one? <laughs> <laughs> well, the companies that take up the vast majority of my time are Tesla and SpaceX. Yeah, so, and then the other companies are much smaller. And I, you know, I, I don't run sort of the X platform day to day. That's Linda Yaccarino. I do drive the product development and the sort of feature improvement, that kind of thing. And um, it's not like it's, uh, these companies are very different in scale. Like Tesla's, I don't know, about 140,000 people. And uh, SpaceX is about 15,000 people. And all the other companies are a few hundred people or less. Yeah. So very, very different scales. Yeah. But apart from that, you also have, if it's six companies, give or take, um, you also have a seventh or what it might be. And that's to navigate bureaucracy and regulations while you're doing this. And this has been a conference about innovation and entrepreneurship and how do we do that when there's so many obstacles in the way. And it, I mean, it's difficult enough to get to Mars. Uh, it's, it's rocket science, literally. But you also have to navigate regulation and precautionary mindsets. So, and I've understood that your style of management is to question every requirement, to create clarity by never accepting that it just came from some department, some place. Every requirement should come with the name of the person who made it, because this makes it possible to question whether it makes sense. On the conviction that only nature makes the real laws, everything else is a recommendation. And that yes. sounds great, but I think many politicians and bureaucrats would beg to differ, right? Yeah. With respect to laws and regulation, we do have a fundamental issue, which is a natural outcome of an extended period of prosperity, where there's, there really hasn't been sort of a global war. Or when the things have been prosperous for a long time, it, you get an accumulation of laws and regulations naturally. And these laws and regulations are immortal, whereas humans are obviously mortal. So the longer you have this generation, this, this creation of uh, rules and regulations, you, but you sort of get to this point where each law and regulation is not perhaps crippling in and of itself, but they're all like little strings that like a million little strings that tie Gulliver down. So it, like each little string, and then eventually the giant can't move. In the West, I think we have created regulatory gridlock where just almost everything is illegal. This is why they can't build um, a high-speed rail in California. They spent $7 billion and there's a 1,600-foot section is all they have to show for it and doesn't even have rails on it. It's really you know too absurd for parity because large projects are essentially illegal in California. So... <laughs> and much of Europe and other countries. So that there has to be some garbage collection process for uh, removing rules and regulations in, in order for society to function and not to uh, get a uh, hardening of the arteries and just to, to the point where you can't do anything. This relates to our risk aversion, I think. In the classical liberal tradition, one important starting point is that we just don't know everything. <laughs> we Nobody does. So the world is a game of learning and of discovery. And therefore, it takes trial and error and experiments to get to the right place. And I've realized that when I'm looking at your businesses, that you're not really the risk-averse type. On the contrary, you shouldn't avoid problems, but test things fast to find out what the problem is fast, and then fix it fast. So a rocket blowing up might not be a mistake. It might be an important step of leveling up to the next stage of knowledge and of discovery. But that's the total opposite of much of the risk-averse culture in many businesses and certainly in, in governments. So many are so conservative that they wouldn't allow anyone to do anything for the first time. So the question is, how do you deal with that kind of risk-averse culture? What changes in culture and in regulation would you make to make the world safe for experiments? Well, like I said, at a government level, I think there should be a regulation removal department. And, and probably some, when you pass new laws, they should have some kind of sunset, perhaps, that they, they need to be reaffirmed before they are expire. Now, a thing that tends to happen is that once regulations are passed, an, an ecosystem of consultants forms around those regulations that wants to keep them going. Environmental regulations are particularly bad in, in this regard. So, you know, and I, I'm very much pro-environment, but the environmental regulations are, in my view, largely terrible. And they're very much sort of permission-based as opposed to 
you have to get permission in advance as opposed to say paying a penalty if you do something wrong which i think would be much more effective to say like look we're going to do this project if something goes wrong then we'll be forced to pay a penalty but we do not need to go through a three or four year environmental approval process so just changing things from you know you have to get admission in advance to you have to pay a penalty if you do something bad i think would be profoundly effective for the advancement of, um, of large projects. I, in general, I think governments around the world should be actively deleting regulations, uh, questioning whether departments exist. Obviously, President Belay is, I think, seems to be doing a fantastic job on this front, uh, just deleting things, deleting entire departments. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> This thing about like if you delete departments and regulations, you can always put them back. <laughs> it turns out that uh, those were very important. You can always put them back. And really, this is like tra taking the brakes off of an economy and of a uh, civilization. We need to snap those strings that are holding Gulliver down and preventing us from making progress as a civilization. Yeah, we've been discussing Argentina here over the past few days and the new classical liberal reform agenda. And the next speaker here on stage is President Millet. And of course, he's uh, up against decades of um, not just obstacles in general, but stagnation. But he's coming there with chainsaw. A very famous clip of him on social media was when he's looking at bureaucracy and spending in government departments and just removing them one by one. Afuera, afuera, which I guess means sort of right. get, just get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Doesn't that remind you of something, your own idea about the value of subtraction when it comes to innovation and business? delete any part of the process you can, and apparently if you don't end up putting 10% back in, you did not delete right. enough. <laughs> Exactly. So um, um, I, I like to use sort of the tools of physics, um, like a first principles approach to things. And um, there's sort of a, a simple algorithm that I developed after making the same mistake over and over again was, and I need to repeat it to myself, so I may hopefully make these mistakes less often, is uh, that you start off first by making the requirements less dumb. So you delete the requirements, d delete and simplify the requirements, because if you, if you don't delete and simplify the requirements, you are simply going to get, in a, in a, the best case outcome is the, the right answer to the wrong question. And then a lot of this involves like sort of technology companies, uh, but you want to delete first, then, then once you've addressed the requirements, attempt to delete the part or process step. If, if you're not forced to put back in at least 10% of what you delete, you're obviously being far too conservative in your deletion. So, but people are often afraid to delete things. And, and I'm like, well, let's just, just, just go ahead and do it. And if you're not putting a little bit back in, you're just not deleting enough, obviously. So I really would, I think this is a very big deal if, if it is over deletion of rules and regulations and you'll end up putting a few back and that's fine. Yeah, I told you he's not risk averse, right? <laughs> you followed. I think that's pretty yeah. sensible. It's just sensible, really. Yeah. I think it stands the test of logical examination. And to me, that seems to be what uh, President Millet is trying to do in Argentina as well, to delete what's not absolutely essential to leave space for yeah. creativity and, and entrepreneurship. You've met him repeatedly. You've seen what's going on in Argentina. Do you have any thoughts about that, his ambitions, how important it is for Argentina and possibly for the rest of the world with the case? right here, right now. I think it is very important that Argentina succeed and that we give President Malay our full support. I, th I think this, <laughs> yeah. and, and my prediction is that in, unless uh, President Malay is, is stopped in some way from taking the actions that he wants to take, that Argentina will have a massive growth in the economy and there will be far more prosperity and, and optimism about the future than there ever ha there has been perhaps in a hundred years. Yeah. And in, in just 10 minutes, Millet will uh, we'll talk about those things from this uh, stage. Uh, would you be able to give him some advice if he wants to turn Argentina into an innovation and entrepreneurship nation again? What, how should he go about it? From everything I've read, he's, he's making all the right moves. I would just encourage the people of Argentina to give him their full support, uh, run this experiment, because clearly the policies of the past have, have not succeeded. We know that for a fact. So let, it, let us, I think, go boldly into the future. I hope the people of Argentina give him their full support. Uh, and, and I think it'll be a very exciting adventure. And I think it's going to work out really well. Could I just then broaden that question about innovation and um, the future of economies? Because right now, it seems like active industrial policy is all the rage. Not just in the old left, but sometimes in the populist right as well. The idea that governments should get heavily involved and 
pick certain winners in business and in technology. They often talk about trying to come up with government moonshots to create the, the future, which I find a little bit ironic because the landing a man on the moon was great, but it didn't give us any kind of industry. We didn't see internet from the space, no moon base, no asteroid mining, no solar power in space, because it was political and not commercial. So, and because it was political, it was okay to spend tons of money, but it also made it unsustainable in the future. It only became a commercially viable final frontier when SpaceX got into the race. So, could you tell us about how you see government's role in innovation Generally, I mean, you were the guy who had to sue NASA to get them to open up a space to, to private providers as well. What is the government's role in building the future of technology? The, the government's role is to ensure that the playing field is a good playing field, that, that there are good rules. The, the government is essentially the, you know, the football league, it, it, like the, the, the referee, the, you know, making sure that, that there's fair play, that, uh, that like the rules are sensible, and allowing the players on the field to play the game. Um, and what happens over time, though, is government keeps growing, and, and, and at a certain point you have more referees than players on the field, um, and, <laughs> and then the game is not good. <laughs> Yeah. You do need referees. I'm not saying you don't need referees, but, but you, you don't want the referees to outnumber the players. <laughs> that would be silly, but that's often what happens. So it, it's just make sure that, that fair games are being played, that there are sensible rules, and I think, uh, and don't get in the way of the players, and uh, the results will be excellent. When we met in Austin recently, you talked about socialism as a concept, and the problem that when the government gets too heavily involved, you lose the feedback mechanisms that really force them to continue to learn, improve, and do things better all over again. Would you be willing to share those thoughts with the audience? Uh, well, like another way to think of the government is like a corporation in the limit. It, it is the biggest corporation, and it is a monopoly, and one that can really can only go bankrupt if the country goes bankrupt. So it, it doesn't have the, the sort of you know, commercial corporations, if, the if they make bad products fail to compete, then they will go bankrupt, and, and they should if they make bad products. So the government is essentially a corporation in the limit. Since it is monopoly and, and there's, there's no... Like, I think one way to think of economy is just in terms of feedback loops. And the feedback loop for government-provided services to be excellent is weak. If you have a, a government monopoly for anything, what do your, you as a consumer have no alternatives? Like you say, think of the Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles, like the DMV, you know, and, and, and it's, it's very inefficient. You, you wouldn't want the DMV to make cars. Um, <laughs> No. Yeah. Uh, and if, if you don't get good service from the government, what do you do? Who do you complain to? Competition breeds excellence because two organizations or more organizations are fighting to make the end consumer happy and one will gain market share if they do a better job than the other. Uh, that's why we really want government to do the least um, because, it, because it's just got the broken feedback loop for improvement. Right, afuera. So we only have four minutes left, so, but I'd like to pick your brains on a couple of topics. Uh, one of them being free speech. You bought Twitter partly to, as you've said, described it, to save an open platform to save free speech. And that's very laudable, but of course there are also trade-offs. The old saying goes, if you keep your mind sufficiently open, people will throw a lot of rubbish into it. So obviously when we have free speech, we'll get some ugly stuff as well, even yeah. toxic. Can you talk about why to you it's so important to save freedom of speech for, to you and for society and the progress of society? For a platform like the X platform, formerly known as Twitter, there will be things that are said that are, that are incorrect. But it provides an immediate feedback loop for correcting that things that are wrong. So somebody says something, well then another person can reply and, and rebut what that person's saying, and there can be just an ongoing sort of dialogue or argument to, and, and someone can read the whole thread and see, okay, this person said something, but somebody counteracted that, there was further rebuttals, there was more context added, and, and that will give them the best understanding of the situation, as compared to, say, a, a legacy news media article where it's, you just have the opinion of the reporter, no rebuttal, no comments, no, no, no counter-argument. Um, and very often what's what printed in the press is completely false, um, and people don't know. But on a, on a real-time interactive platform like X, like I said, they can see the, not just what somebody said, but what are the rebuttals, what are the counter-arguments. And we've got things like community notes, which I think is very helpful, where if something if somebody says something false, sort of inaccurate or misleading, then sort of the core secret to community notes is that for a note to be attached to a post, people who normally disagree about a subject must agree on that, on, on that community note for it to be shown. So the probability of it being accurate 
um, is is very high because people who historically disagree are are only going to agree on something that is quite accurate. So it's all down to feedback loops, basically. Um, I think you, so, yes. You've been remarkably generous with your time, so I'll just give you a last question, possibility for some last thoughts. It seems to me that your take on the world is that progress doesn't happen by itself. It's not automatic. After the moon landing, we went back from the final frontier for half a century, and Argentina has been stagnating for almost a, a century by now. It takes human agency. Someone's got to do it. And in the light of that, are you optimistic about human progress? And if so, what are you optimistic about? And what do you think that people who are listening today and, and think tanks like the Cato Institute can do to speed progress up? It, it does seem as though like civilization is reaching new heights in technology. And, and, and we, we, I think we've got quite a bit of momentum. I, I do worry about certain existential risks like the low birth rate, uh, which is accelerating in, in most countries. This is one of those things that I think is underrated as an issue, is that if there are no, no, no humans, there's no humanity. They, you have to make them somehow. I think we should be very concerned about accelerating implosion of, of the birth rate. This is a super big deal. Like, basically, nothing else matters if there are no humans. <laughs> like, as an initial premise, you must have humans for, for there to be civilization, <laughs> unless we're going to leave it all to the robots. This, I think, is, is massively, massively underweighted. And I don't have a great solution to it, but it must be solved somehow, or humanity will dwindle to nothing. Perhaps if we give people a hope and a belief in the future and that it'll get better, that they want more people to see it. I, I agree. I think we should, we should have an optimistic view of the future. I do th think that one bad, like, bad thing about the environmentalist movement is that the, in, in, the, in, in, in the sort of extreme form of the environmentalist movement, it, it, you, people start to view humans as a plague on the surface of the earth, as a fundamentally bad thing. And w w with the implication that if all humans disappeared, somehow earth would be, would be better off. Um, this is the, the extinctionist movement. And I think you can, you can really, I think at a fundamental level, uh, you can think of things as a fight between mansionist and extinctionist philosophies. But that, that's what really matters. Everything else is, uh, if humans go extinct or, or civilization collapses, whatever policies we may have are irrelevant. First and foremost, we must have an expansionist philosophy for, for civilization and for consciousness. Uh, we must seek to you know, go, go beyond what we've done in the past to increase the, I think, increase the number of humans. This is, this is incredibly fundamental. One way or another, this, this must happen. So the final um, message is go forth and procreate. Uh, you, yes. <laughs> and go forth and multiply. <laughs> in a free civilization, yeah. <laughs> yes.